Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 345. Written by Pepper Antique. The voice of Crag, as Elixon had called her, was not what James had expected. Admittedly his view of orcs was mostly based on the surly quartermaster at the king's castle, a large, one-eyed man named Krog. Between him and the handful of other orcs James had dealt with on a semi-regular basis had given James a sort of generic English, hoodlum vibe. Like something from the old Sherlock Holmes movies, or that one English gangster series that his dad had apparently been a fan of. The voice of Crag was nothing like any of them. And as he thought of it, James realized that made sense. According to Elixir the crag was the birthplace of orcs in this world. One earth it would be their equivalent to the portion of Africa that had been determined to be the cradle of humanity. Of course people living thousands of miles away for centuries, or even millennia, wouldn't look or act the same as the ones here. So this is the summoned hero and new prince? The tall, almost fully covered, orc woman said as she stepped off of the lift and approached. Crag was, well, he was a brute. Just looking at him could tell a person that. Talking with him for a few minutes simply confirmed it. And according to both Amina and Keela he had once been a brutally capable wielder of a massive warhammer. Until a battle had cost him his eye, and also earned him a bride and some resulting children. The voice of Crag was nothing like that. She had the same general physiology as any other orc James had ever seen. This included being nearly seven feet tall, having dark greenish-brown skin, though he could only see that on her hands and around her eyes, incredibly long arms, and broad shoulders that any pro football coach would beg for on their linemen. But where Krog and the other orcs James knew were somewhat hunched, likely from the limitations of the buildings they were accustomed to, the voice of Krag stood tall and sure. Where other orcs were boisterous and jolly, or else sullen and silent, the voice spoke in as refined of a manner as any of the nobles James had met in this world. He got the same sense of sureness from her when she spoke that he got when he heard the king speak, or the late General Crick or Secretary Grant. But there was a calmness there that he wasn't used to on politicians or military personnel. She also had eyes the same dark purple as the deadly gas that filled her home. Elixir broke him out of his observations as the tall, veiled, orc leader finally got to within a few feet of them. So it is, great speaker. He said with a small bow and his new wife, my younger sister Amina, and their travelling companions. He added as he gestured to Gorna and Glag. It is good to see you again. She bowed her head to Elixir in return. It has been far too long since I have gazed upon the sky clearly. She said. Then her eyes moved in a way that made it obvious that she was smiling. Or upon the face of a friend. Then she turned to regard James and the others again. I welcome you to my home. She said with a slight tilt of her head. Or at least as close to it as you can safely come. She turned back to the prince. I take it there's to be a feast? Elixir smiled widely. We've also got some Sidonian gold in one of our cold rooms for you. Once again the massive orc's eyes implied a smile had formed on her face. You know me too well. She said. Then she held her hand out to James. James looked at Amina, who was staring at the offered hand in confusion. Then he looked at Elixir. It is customary for the voice of Crag to walk in hand with whoever the highest ranking person in the area is. He said. Then he raised an eyebrow in question. Which I was fairly certain was me. Hero summoned by God's outranks crown prince. She replied coolly. James gritted his teeth at that, remembering how Elixir had said she was her people's spiritual leader but he had learned his lesson from Vatria, and he took the offered hand. He had a feeling that it was going to be a long night. So um. How did everyone, like the trip? Samantha asked as she stood up in front of all the werewolves. She, wasn't terribly fond of public speaking. Have a good time? There was a bit of a murmur as everyone talked to the people around them a bit, some nodded heads, as usual a handful in the back of the room looked more annoyed than anything. Same as every group meeting. She could hear a handful of mentions of squirrels. I'm glad to hear that it went well. I know I enjoyed getting to stretch my legs a bit. She looked down at the note card with the details that had been given to her by Dr. Munro. We've got some really good news. She said with a smile. 
time. Starting next week, we will be allowed to have monitored visits from our friends and loved ones. Um. People with spouses will even be given time in a secure cottage for um. Well you know. She said with a slight grin. There was a hissing noise from one of the wolves to her left that had two of his fingers in his mouth. He looked confused for a moment before trying again, with the same result. Damn. I guess we can't whistle anymore. He said with a look of mild disappointment. This drew short-lived laughter from most of them. Luckily the one who'd attempted to whistle was part of the laughing. Anyways. You guys can discuss that when you have the family meetings next week. Um, there will be some limitations and precautions necessary if you do opt for that. Just, safety and health stuff mainly. She said. The laughter had helped her relax a little bit. I'm the big one though. She began, causing everyone to focus a bit more. Is that, starting this next month the doctors are going to be going over everyone's notes and running us all through a series of group assessments. Mainly interviews with the doctors as a group. This caused even the wolves at the back to sit forward with curiosity. And if the doctors determine that you have um, adjusted, well enough. They'll be letting us out into the surrounding community here at Sturgis on a trial basis. We'll be monitored, and escorted. Both for the safety of the community and Dash, she said with a raised finger as she saw some of them getting ready to speak up. For our safety. They've assured me that we'll be allowed to go anywhere we want. And do. Almost anything we want. Within reason. They just don't want any of us having anything go wrong. No repeats of what happened when we became this way. There were mumbles and questions and more than a few happy faces. But there were also some less than happy faces. What's next? One of the back row wolves asked. Leashes? We've been here over six months now. Yeah. And what are the criteria for these panels of judges? Cause that's what it sounds like. Another one asked. Samantha held her hands up in a warding gesture as the questions began to ramp up. She hadn't been prepared for any of this. Luckily Dr. Munro stepped in. Everyone please. She said loudly as she stepped up next to Samantha. Please. Settle down. It still took a few moments before the roar settled down to a gentle murmur. We're not your captors. She said. We're not your wardens. This isn't a prison. Sure seems like it sometimes. The first of the back wolves said. I know. She said. I know. But at the end of the day we are a hospital. She gestured at the few other doctors in the room. Our priority is the health and safety of the community around us. And our number one priority is the health and safety of our patients. And that's you. She said with a gesture at the wolves. She waited a few moments to let everyone sit on that. We are in uncharted territory with you guys. She continued. We want nothing more than to let you all go back to your normal lives. To the extent that you can now. But we had to fight hard to keep the military from keeping you as actual prisoners. The only reason they didn't is because of how public the wolf outbreak was, and the fact that that pack of wild ones managed to get away and split up. Should have gone with them. Someone whispered. Do you really believe that Mr. Schmidt? She asked testily. Cause from what I was told of your case, one of your biggest reasons for letting the hospital take you in was because you didn't want to kill anyone. And that's what they were doing. What they are still doing according to the news. Schmidt grumbled, but remained quiet. You're all here because you couldn't, or wouldn't, let yourselves do that for one reason or another. The doctor said. We're here to help convince the government that if you go out into the public, that will remain the case. That's all we're trying to do. That and help you adjust to your new lives. Fletcher, one of the few non-wolves in the room who also wasn't a doctor, spoke up. That said, any of you that desires to be discharged may do so. He said. But you would be doing so at your own risk. And I guarantee that the government would be watching you like a hawk for any slip-ups. And by now you've all seen how they handled the other wolves. Wouldn't expect much less if I were you. 
they're gonna do that anyways. Someone closer to the front said. They didn't sound as angry as the back row, mostly just concerned. Probably. Samantha said. I would. And I was one of them before this happened. She shrugged. We're dangerous now. Whether we like it or not. And, as we all saw out at the lake, we aren't in complete control of our brains anymore. And if that. She took a deep breath. Goddess. Decides to mess with us. We might not even be able to do anything about it. I mean. I told the other guy to fuck off and he still made me into the. She looked over to Dr. Munro. What did they end up calling me? She asked uncomfortably. Wonder Wolf. The doctor said. Samantha groaned. That's terrible. She said to herself, her eyes unfocused as they stared at the podium. Then she took a deep breath and looked back out. Look. We have to acknowledge that there's merit to not just. Letting us run around without making sure we've got a handle on this. And the first steps is trial runs. There was grumbling. But most of them had to admit the logic in it. What about me? Said their youngest member, a young boy of only eight years old named Tommy who, thanks to the wolf outbreak, was an orphan now. His downcast eyes and trembling voice made everyone stop talking and reconsider. I don't have anywhere to go. Suddenly everyone else's complaint seemed stupid. Mrs. Ramirez, a 52-year-old florist who had been turned into a wolf while watering her shop's plants for the night, wrapped her arm around the boy. She'd become a sort of adoptive mother to Tommy since that night. You can come with me Miho. She said with a gentle hug. Samantha moved past the podium and knelt down in front of the two of them. She lifted the young wolf's head up a bit with her chin. And maybe we can go back to the lake every now and then. She said with a smile. I saw how much you liked swimming in it. She looked off to the side and Dr. Munro nodded with a smile. Wanna do that? Tommy nodded. That's another thing. She said as she stood back up and moved back to the podium. I know it's awkward. And probably cliche since we're wolves now. But we should probably stick close to each other. Look out for each other. Just in case anything goes wrong even while we're out and about. The back wolves began grumbling again, but she beat them to the chase. I'm not saying we have to be friends. And for God's sake I'm not gonna call us a pack. She reassured them. We're not gonna be that cliché. But I do think we should at least stay as. Well. This. She said, gesturing at the lot of them. A support group. After all, we're the only ones who know what we're going through. Even once we're out of here. She looked at Fletcher, and tried not to stare. But she needed the lawyer to know she was talking to the hospital. And we will all get out of her eventually. We should stay in touch. Exchange info and maybe do a monthly meeting, even if only online. She shrugged. Plus it'll let us keep tabs on each other in case something happens to any of us. By the government or by just. People being assholes. Despite not being fans of the whole situation, even the wolves in the back row could admit that that was probably a good idea. As the meeting slowly relaxed and opened up to people talking about how they were doing, Dr. Munro stood off to the side suppressing a smile. She was glad to see that she'd been right about Samantha and her role in the werewolf group.